again. And I've been working on similar projects for a longer time, but at some point there was a merge of my other software and Gaggle. And the way I want to structure this presentation is that I'm first going to talk about what the Gaggle is and what you can do with Gaggle. And then I'm going to introduce the Tata API and kind of show how Gaggle is used in uh, different programming languages. And uh, both um, C and Ruby, I'm going to show an XML based format. And then I want to talk about how Gaggle works internally. And I'm going to talk about um, quite a few different things that have not been done that can be done in the future within the confines of the Gaggle internals. First, I'm going to start out with um, talking about what the Gaggle is. It's a raster processing engine, it's graph based, <coughs> has plugins, high dynamic range, supports large images. Uh, it's a project started in the year 2000, which was dormant for a while. And uh, on the side on the left there, we have the contributors to the project in order of appearance in the chain block. Um, and the project is actually getting quite healthy. Um, my name was the final name added in June of last year. So all the names below here have come since June 2006. Um, that's kind of impressive in my opinion. It's like those many people are on the film go, oh, something's happening and want to do something and think this is a good idea to work on. One of the main things that Gaggle does is compositing. Compositing is the combination of images to create new images. And in applications like GIMP and Photoshop, one thing you use is having layers. Oops. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the presentation tool is actually using Gaggle. So I'm demonstrating now compositing in Gaggle. It's not very advanced. I'm moving the layer around. I can decide I want to tweak the opacity of this layer. Well, that's kind of just the basics of compositing. Um, another main thing that Gaggle provides is non-destructive editing. Non-destructive editing is a different way of working with images from the way people traditionally, for instance, work in a GIMP. In a GIMP, it's like you decide you want to do something. Yeah, I'm going to change this image now. I'm going to create a, a rather nifty effect on it. I'm going to first blur it. So we want to blur. There we have a blurred image. That's nice. I'll blur it a bit more. Okay, and then I decide that um, hmm, I think I want to threshold this image like that. But since this was a rather dark image, I'm going to actually reduce the threshold I use to see more of the details. But since I blurred my image so much, and I don't actually see any details of that chemical factory, so I want to. Go in and say, well, I want to have this adjustment of the pool. I want to blur it less. And since what I actually have stored is the operations I'm doing to the image buffer, um, I can go back and change the mind of the parameters or some other things. And I could now add even more stuff and say, I want to take this image and I want to rotate it a bit. Then I rotate it around the origin. This looks very, very bad, but. Uh, I want to have it. If I was going to have proper user interface for this, that should have rotated it around the center or something. But the thing works. And yet another thing that's important and one of the shortcomings of the current GIMP core is that the current GIMP core is limited to 8 bits per component. That means um, when you have a color image, you have red, green, and blue light, which is mixed together to produce the colors that the human visual system can perceive. Um, but GIF currently only uses 8 bits per component, and that's not a lot. And it's kind of low precision, it's kind of borderline, it's acceptable. We can accept output that is rendered in 8 bits per pixel, but for internal processing, forget about it. You want either 16 bits per pixel, or perhaps you want to go even higher. This image is an OpenEXR image, and it's 32 bit floating point per component which is the same thing that I gave at the moment is working with internally. So I can take that image and say I want to adjust the 
brightness of it and the um, contrast. And the first thing I'm going to do is to reduce the contrast of it. And then we should be able to. I want to reduce it even more because this image has a lot of detail in the sky that we originally couldn't see. That kind of comes forth now, but okay, that's not the way to see the image either. But I just want to show that within the image there is a lot of detail. I don't have proper, proper algorithms within Gaggle to do what you call tone mapping, to do what normal people think of HDR, high dynamic range images, as the results you have in these hyper weak colors. But that's actually low dynamic range images. It's a low dynamic range representation of a high dynamic range image. Well, Gaggle currently lacks those kinds of transformations. It has some hacky stuff that looks very, very bad, which I should do together over Christmas. But, um, those are kind of some of the basic features. Another kind of important thing is probably that, um, um, well, this is not entirely true. Whoops. <clears throat> I have moved too far. I was thinking to actually show there with another application, so I just skipped that. I'll rather go forward to the Gaggle API. And the core of the Gaggle API is that you have a graph. And the example I'm going to look at is this example. And I'm going to actually zoom out a bit more. So we see a rendering of um, the result. What we see here is that we have loaded an image. That image has been blurred. And over that image, we're going to place another loaded image, which have, we have adjusted the opacity of. And this end result, we're going to display. And, and the terminology used in Gaggle for describing this is that this is a graph. This is a compositing or processing graph. And all the circles here, the big ellipses, are nodes. Some of the nodes are source nodes. Both of these are filter nodes. Filter nodes are nodes that have one input pad and one output pad. There is also a um, composer node, which takes two images and combines them in some way. That has two input pads and one output pad. And finally, there's a sync node, in this case, display, which in this case we show it to the screen. You could also have a node that wrote a PNG file or added a frame to a video sequence. So this is kind of a mental model of what we're going to construct. We're going to create these six nodes and link them together and they'll display that to your processing. So the first example I'm going to show is how this would be implemented in Ruby. And first thing I do is that I require the Gaggle library I create the graph, actually, which is a top-level node. Um, in Gaggle, graphs themselves can be used as nodes. I'm not doing that in this instance, but we'll return to it later in the presentation. So, I create new tiles from this graph. I just call it graph Gaggle. And um, two of the type load, one Gaussian blur, one of the type opacity, one of the type over, and one of the type display. And those are the operations that the nodes will perform. And there's also some parameters. For the ones on load, I'm setting to PNG files, and with the standard deviation, not the radius, this is a more mathematically correct way of describing the equation blur. And, and also set the opacity. And then I'm saying that the out output from first load should go into the input of blur. And the output of blur should go into the input of over, and the output of over should go into the input of display. Now I connect the rest of the graph, which is loaded to opacity into the auxiliary input of over. And finally, I'm saying that, okay, display, do your work. And that will result in um, Gaggle making sure that all the data that display needs has been processed. I might break that up in chunks, but you don't know that using this API. And finally, that buffer is provided to display so it can do its work and then it comes to sleep for 10 seconds and let's continue. And 
This is a slightly more verbose example, but it is exactly the same example. I'm just going to talk through this one in detail. This is um, the C API, or it's rather the human friendly version of the C API, um, which is uh, very similar to how G object in G works, in where you have uh, properties that can be set with values handled in kind of a named key value pairs. And the linking is slightly different, but it's exactly the same concepts used. So I'm creating that graph. I'm telling game mode process on the display mode, wait for 10 seconds, free up the memory used by the graph, and click the Gecko library. The entire API of Gecko is contained in a single header file at the moment called Gecko.h. Well, that, that is kind of possible to duplicate off the definition of the functions from the internal header files. And, and uh, this is the API documentation which is generated from comments in the header file using kind of the same kind of syntax that people use normally, like GTK doc or docsigen or Java doc. Uh, but I wrote a custom tool just because it's a single header file and I wanted this to be the reference documentation. There is also more language bindings. Um, there is a Python language binding which has the core mapped but syntactic sugar to make it more convenient to program in Python hasn't been added, but you can construct graphs, read back the values of properties, do processing. And uh, there's yet another way to describe exactly the same thing we had earlier, and that's an XML-based serialization format. And um, where I load a background image, kind of like background layer, and then there's kind of a Fact layer, adjustment layer, filter, whatever you want to call it, which blurs it. And uh, on top of that is another layer, which uses over as its layer mode. And the contents of that layer is another such stack of operations, which starts out with loading the Gecko image, changing the opacity, and that's the result. So this is um, something that, well, this is currently the serialization format Gecko uses. This is probably not what's going to be the file, next generation file format of the game, but something looking very similar to this. Um, there's also a project called Open Raster, which um, is kind of cooperation between me as like release IDs and things based on things before it, and uh, the Krita developers. We are discussing kind of standardizing a way to have an open document based format with an XML based description of the hierarchy of layers and how things should be composited together to be able to exchange things between applications. And we do think that we should be able to come up with something that um, wouldn't be too hard for others to implement and to understand that will also meet the needs that Gecko can provide for GIMP and the way that the Twig developers have about the core of Twitter. When it comes to how Gecko actually works, I'm not going to talk in detail about all things, but this is a kind of structural overview of the components it consists of. And uh, as you see, there's a blue line going across here, and that's public API. That is the API that um, is all functionality that is used to implement the Ruby binding, the Python binding, the C sharp binding, or I'm probably I'm guessing there will be more language bindings coming up soon. Um, and it's also what GIMP will mostly use. GIMP being kind of a special case customer might actually want to bypass the public API in some instances. Um, but Strictly speaking, it shouldn't need to. So there is a public API which is stable. It hasn't actually really changed. You can change your mind. It's like, hmm, I don't like the name of that method. So we rename methods. But I think the only thing we've done since 
first public release in the end of December, has been renaming methods. We haven't changed what is actually happening. Um, and we're starting to be quite satisfied with how we name the methods. But beyond this, public API is a Gaggle core. Um, and um, the Gaggle core hasn't gotten that much attention as the public API. The Gaggle core works. It provides a working implementation doing what the public API kind of proposes that this is what Gaggle is supposed to be able to do. Um, but it's going to need to be reworked. Thankfully, that can be done without having to change the public API. And the Gaggle core builds directly on glib and gobject, which kind of a nice enhanced standard library for C, given object orientation, module loading, property setting, given cross-platformness, and takes away a lot of the headaches of working in C. And, and it's built also a lot of those bubbles, which I'll talk a bit more about. And the plugin API is in no way stable. It's nice, small, neat, but uh, it will have to change as desires for more capabilities of the engine come. So, kind of have a very dual duality kind of based answer to whether people should be hacking plugins for Gaggle. Uh, I don't want to have to migrate and maintain all the plugins people have written when the API changes, which it will do, but the API as it is now is kind of nice and easy to write plugins for. Um, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, perhaps I will write a wish list of these are the plugins that I want and I kind of desire to actually keep moving along if I change the API seriously. Um, and that's also where all kinds of other third party dependencies come in. It's the plugins depending on them, the Kegel core itself depends on very, very few things. Bubble. Bubble is um, a universal translator. People familiar with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy knows a fish that translates human brain waves, or actually sentient brain waves, um, into other brain waves in another host, so you can all magically understand other languages. The problem when dealing with graphics often is that there is an awful amount of ways to represent pixels. Um, you have different color models. You have RGB, you have HSV, you have YCVCR, you have LAB, you have HSV, and you have IPVPR. You, okay, you have a lot. And then you have many, many different data types. You have 32 bit floating points, you have 64 bit floating points, you have 16 bit floating points, you have 8 bit um, of different variations, you have 16 bit of different variations. And you can probably dream up more other variations of data types. And then you're allowed to mix any color model with any kind of data type, with any permutation of the order of the components. And that's the thing most people do because when you're writing something, so you just kind of look, oh, I wonder why the heck they're using that kind of pixel format. And, but and all kinds of library I'm interfacing with has a special way of dealing with pixels. Um, so this needs to be handled in a nice way. Um, <laughs> okay, those are the implemented color pixel formats in the bubble at the moment. And um, bubble is a library where you can actually register. It's like this is a color model, and this is the way you can transform 64-bit floating point values in RGB with alpha to this other color model. For instance, um, YUV. So you register one reference conversion to do that job. And you also register, if you need new data types, it's like, this is how I convert the value in um, the psi IE LAB 8-bit um, integer version for chroma components. That's a special way of encoding pixel data in 8-bit in one of the components of one color model. And you have a reference conversion for that 64 bit floating point as well. Now Bubble knows how to convert 64 bit floating point RGBA into Psi IE LAB with any of those camping types you wanted. This might be quite slow, but at least it's able to do it. And on top of that, 
and it has the ability for shortcuts. So the conversions you're actually using quite a bit, and for instance, converting um, 32-bit floating point um, linear light RGB, which is what Gary is using internally, to gamma corrected 8-bit RGB, that can't be to be fast. So you can register a shortcut. But Bubble refuses to use that shortcut unless it passes a regression test with random data passed through both the reference implementation, which is kind of slow, and its optimized register version. So if it passes validation, okay, it will use it. But that's not enough because it's kind of boring to write these optimized versions. So Bubble will also allow you to chain together these shortcuts and the regression test them. So this matrix I have here is the current version of Bubble. I will zoom out. Current version of Bubble with the um, source formats going down the left and going in columns is destination formats. So the place where there is a single dot is where there is a hand-coded conversion. All the others are where there is a chain of conversions put together which doesn't lose any quality but is faster than the reference implementation. Um, and uh, kind of when I'm programming, sometimes, oh, this looks very, very slow. And um, then I can tell some other profiling gaggle to show me where does the time go. And if it says that in one of the nodes, most of the time is spent in bubble, then, uh oh, uh, I will run some other introspection, giving me such thing as this, which will highlight which conversions have been used. And if there's a blue dot in one of the blank cells, it tells me here it's using a reference implementation. So I can implement either that one, or one I can see in the neighborhood, and there will be more fast versions available for Bubble to use. One thing that Gale currently does is that it does its processing in chunks. When it's going to render a large image, for instance this presentation, I had it pre-rendered in a cache, but uh, it will kind of start to say, I want to render this small rectangle, this small rectangle, and going through the entire large, large buffer. And um, you probably saw it when I was doing the non-destructive editing, that things were updating in small chunks. And um, the operations in the nodes know what data they need to compute a given rectangle from their inputs. And they also have the ability to say that if this changes in my input, it will affect the following rectangle in my output. And so using that, Yale is able to determine what's the smallest amount of buffers that needs to be computed to satisfy a given rendering rectangle request. I'm not going to go into details about the bits of how that work. Um, but I'm going to show the source code of a uh, plugin. Uh, on the screen here, I have the entire source code for the brightness contrast operation. Um, it um, does some kind of nasty C preprocessor stuff to hide boiler code, boiler plate code of G object away. Um, on the top, it registers that it has two properties, which are doubles, brightness and contrast. Their minimum and maximum values, default values, and documentation string. Um, and then there is um, the actual name of the operation. Um, it includes the name of this source code file. That's the bizarre thing in this thing. It also says what is the superclass. This is a point filter, which makes it a bit easier for sort of write action processing function. And there's a description, and it includes the gaggle file, which charms all the magic incantations that leads to G object actually working with inheritance and stuff. And what it does is that it includes this source file, and those macros are expanded something like five times, giving you both the structure <coughs> containing all the properties, giving you registration of that G object type system. Um, and adds the code needed to make this be a plugin. So it ends up all this C file, drops another such C file into one of the directories with operations, type make, type make install, and you install a new plugin. 
um, the actual processing function for a point filter, a filter that only depends on a single pixel original value to compute this new value, um, takes the actual operation itself um, as first parameter and pointer to a linear input buffer, a linear output buffer, and the count of pixels that it has to process. Um, so there's a loop going through all the pixels um, doing arithmetic on the color bits of the pixel and um, just setting the alpha of the output to what the input was. Um, by default, game is working in 32-bit RGB floating point with an alpha value. I could here say that, well, this is not what I actually want. Mm, and in a more advanced plugin, I would just use bubble to convert things back and forth. The plugin is most actually to work with just linear buffers. That Gagel internally uses tiles and uh, such things is hidden away. Um, and uh, my main motivation for doing that is sanity of programmers and that code should be readable. Uh, if people have tried to study some of the plugins in the game and learn something from them and change code in them, um, there is a lot of cases in special conditions and uh, it optimized quite far away from readability. <coughs> um, so I'm going to deny performance optimization to anything in Gaggle and say that, well, it probably fixes itself when the architecture changes or something. Um, well, it's still quite fast actually and there's a lot of things that can be optimized um, with the current architecture. And actually, even having 8-bit and 16-bit versions of all these operations is, in my opinion, nonsense. Um, I would rather have this library be able to make accurate, high-quality results and be usable for signal processing research and similar, rather than provide results fast. Um, there is more samples of how one can add operations to Gaggle. This is abuse of Ruby for generating code. Each of these lines is a plugin. Um, adding one more line to that array and running the generator would create a new plugin. Um, that's the amount of code I'm comfortable with writing to add a new plugin. Um, there might be other ways of doing it, but um, that is the core of what some of the nodes are actually doing, so it shouldn't be more sophisticated than that. A third way of doing plugins, or create, adding new functionality, new nodes that can be used, is to create meta operations. That's operations that are built up from core components, other operations or nodes that exist. And the example here is a drop tab. Um, the graph shown here is output done, layout of the graph is, and just introspection of Gaggle was it running. And so kind of the order is how I would lay them out manually. We have loading of um, the background image, and we have loading of the Gecko logo, which is shifted, translated, and about a drop shadow both too, and then composited over the background image before it's passed down to some kind of output. The drop shadow itself is a graph which is the graph in the middle there and the input image is loaded and um, using ported up compositing operators there is created a duplicate version of it which is made black which is blurred and over that duplicated version is the original and the result of this compositing is the output that's handed out. So, this graph is the drop shadow operation of Gecko, and it's kind of written in Gecko itself. And the way of doing that isn't like I would like it to be at the moment. You have to write C code to hook up that graph, and you have no real way of setting properties. And I imagine that the way to do this would be an XML file or something, and not a kind of write code. Um, how is my time? Okay. Um, future work. 
there's a lot of things I can talk about there. Um, but feel free to break in and start asking me questions. Um, for the core of Gaggle, one of the main new things that I want to add there is um, parallel and perhaps distributed processing. Uh, at the moment, this machine is a dual core machine, but only one of the cores are active. And uh, because Gaggle is even processed at the moment. I kind of actually suspect that once I start doing that and try to make it multi-threaded, it won't be much of an issue because the operations themselves are all that already re-entered for other purposes. And, but I consciously avoided starting hacking that with all Boston because I feared that uh, if I did, it was definitely going to be more work than I suspected and I wouldn't have time to prepare a presentation. Um, more sophisticated caching. Um, as it is now, Gaggle is only caching the output. What in GIMP is called the projection is the final rendered image of all the layers. And it is possible to cache things on more levels, to add a cache on every node in the graph. Um, and by doing so, uh, Gaggle wouldn't have to recompute everything from the loaded files all the way up to the displayed image. When you were dragging a layer around, you kind of got like, stop. Up to this point in the graph, all the have the results. So when this thing is dragged over it, I only need to compute things from there and forward. And that would make it very much faster already to cover an interactive application like this one. Um, it would be nice to replace the entire way of writing operations and the processing with something that used the just in time compiler. It would be retargetable and perhaps that would be a way to have GPU acceleration. That's more similar to the original plans for Gecko. Suppose you use something called GIL, the general image language, which was kind of a preprocessor for generating 8-bit, 16-bit, 2-bit versions of all operations. Um, I don't think that's the reason I actually wanted just in time compiler. It would be more for this reason to be able to use and hardware AD acceleration architectures. Bubble itself, which is a foundation of Gaggle, has a problem in that it um, uses RGBA as its kind of intermediate conversion format. And for most applications, that's not a problem. Most color models people work with are three-dimensional, are three-stimulus color models. And there's one exception, and that's CMYK, which has four components. Um, and if you have CMYK with alpha, okay, you have five components, you have a five-dimensional space. And the problem is that you will have information loss going from CMYK A to RGBA and to another high-dimensional format. Um, I'm not quite sure if this belongs in Bubble or not, I haven't decided. Um, but ideally, I would want Bubble to be able to deal with spectral data. Um, it's kind of aiming rather high, but it's fun to work with spectral images. Um, but I think most of that actually belongs outside. Different libraries doing uh, color management, like little CMS, and we we'll just keep using the SRGB primers internally in Gaggle and Bubble. Yes? Can you look at GLSL as a Uh, I haven't really looked into it. Um, at the moment, I kind of just for the operations and what's within Gaggle, and uh, that's just there as kind of a side effect of stabilizing the public API. Um, yeah, you'd be talking about Ola and Jolt and uh, such, or? write a kind of small Gaggle backend that only does that kind of processing because that. if you have a small core set of the operations that at the moment are in C, you wouldn't have to change public API. So if you could create a different thing that would be faster, it would be nice for previews and just such. Um, there's one thing I didn't add to this list which is rather important. 
and that's um, the ability to um, scale parameters so that when you request um, a single version like this, um, I wouldn't have to actually do all the rendering. Okay, I wasn't finished with that non-destructive and didn't care about this and wasn't visible. Um, but that it could work on scaled on versions of all the images to create this result. Um, and to be able to do that, all the operations, all the plugins, need to be able to understand what it means that you have a scale factor included in how the processing is done. That's okay for all point operations, like compositing, that's no problem. For a Gaussian blur, it's no problem. Um, for scaling, rotation, and all of our final operations, it's not a problem. And by doing that, you also have things like unsharp masking, which is actually just a map operation on top of Gaussian blur. You start having almost all the things you actually kind of need for basic photo editing, and should be able to have live previews that are lively fast without the issue. But it's not there yet, so the Gable now works, it will have to process the full resolution image to get that data. But that should be possible to actually change without changing the public API. There's other abstractions on top of Gable that would be fun to have. Um, and that's the ability to actually um, do animations, animated properties, etc. Um, but that, that doesn't belong in the core section, that belongs somewhere else. This application, by the way, which I'm using for this presentation, um, is written in Ruby, and uh, I'll probably blog about it and put the source online when I have network and time to do it. It's kind of neat, but mostly hacked together to actually just demonstrate together. There's a set of operations that also would be nice to have. It's like lib open roll to um, um, read the grayscale data directly from raw photo files. Um, at the moment, I'm using that through DC raw, um, but I don't like having to just ask for a large chunk of data waiting for another process to give me that grayscale image in one big chunk. I want more direct access to it. Um, more than once, they are demosaicing routines. Um, at the moment, with low raw data. It sucks more than most things you could probably see because it does some weird neighbor stuff. Um, noise reduction. There is some noise reduction already implemented, um, but porting more wouldn't really work. Tone mapping. The ability to do frequency domain processing in the Fourier domain. Um, it's quite close to have a full SVG 1.1 filter set implemented. So being able to claim that it conforms to that would be nice. Um, so, those are on my wish list. Um, and uh, Gaga at the moment isn't able to implement the um, painting with brushes, like one of the core things of him to do, or rather, it's able, but it doesn't have the plugins needed to do exactly that. We did a prototype test of doing that, and it works nice. I'll talk about animated properties. Um, I did have a project earlier, which kind of went under the radar for most people, which was um, um, video editor compositing application, uh, which was built on the predecessor to Gaggle called GGGL, uh, or rather one predecessor to Gaggle, it was a separate project that I coded. Um, I used it for creating a few mu music videos. Um, that application probably is impossible to build right now. And the reason for that is that uh, it was written at a time before the Cairo API was stable. So it had a rather extensive set of custom Cairo widgets and the uh, mixture of GTK and Cairo before GTK included the Cairo. Um, but most of those things should be easily to re implement. Uh, on top of Gable now. Just this week, I um, started hacking together the FFmpeg input and output operations. So one sample of using that is... Um, okay, this is not the way that Elegant Stream actually looks. Uh, this is more a tunified version. And 
the reason I actually coded up the um, FFmpeg input and output operations was that I wanted to do a test just to figure out what actual live video. Um, so within the Gaggle source code, there is a directory called operations, and within there is a directory called workshop. And those are all the plugins that are not compiled by default. My workshop contains quite a bit more things than the one in subversion, but there is also the FF load and FF save. What I wanted to show was um, just a small Ruby script called test, which is the thing that generated, I think I actually did a load up. That is the Ruby script I used to generate the video file that uh, was kind of a cartoon-like version of Elephant 3. Requiring Gaggle and setting up a small graph where I'm using a... Mm, that's actually a filter that's not in subversion yet, but will be checked in soon, which is an uh, edge-enhancing uh, blur filter. Edge-preserving and edge-enhancing blur filter which ends up actually being cartoonification and running multiple iterations. So I have a source node loading with FFmpeg, three such filters, and FFmpeg say at the end, connect together with graph, which is actually just a chain, and uh, within Ruby we saying that 240 times do such a thing that you set the property frame on the source node to be the frame number desired, and um, tell it to process once. Then we will process the graph and append the frame to the video. And each time it does that, it adds the frame to the output video. And when it's done, there is a video file. Then I've talked for 40 minutes. And want more questions? Yes? The bubble up API is uh, very, very small. Um, the essence of, I can show the bubble documentation. Um, the basic use of, usage of bubble is um, saying that you want bubble to process. You want to run a bubble process on a bubble fish. You create a bubble fish by saying what is the source format and the output format. You can use all the names that are listed in the reference of bubble. And a pointer to the input and output buffer and how large those buffers are. That is at least kind of the core of you can also construct new formats. That's kind of if you start doing that, is you're more on unstable ground. But I don't see that changing very much either. It's like you say that the model here is kind of correct with RGB, and the following components now will be of type unsigned date. And uh, in this case, it's actually um, instead of RGB, it's VTR, kind of opposite order in memory of the bytes. And so on. Many have constructed new formats which could be used in place of those strings and um, creating the bubble fish. Um, and when it comes to the list of implemented things, those are the data types in bubble. Um, and that is the color models. I have separate color models for. Um, gamma corrected and non-gamma corrected, as well as pre-multiplied alpha and not pre-multiplied alpha. Um, the reason for that is that I had a core that worked and just treat them as separate color models. I didn't have to add any more um, things to it. And um, um, well, I see no reason to change it since it works. That's kind of from a very kind of structured point of view, you would actually have a special property like the pre modified alpha and non pre modified alpha. But uh, as long as I keep the core set of color models low, this will still work. Um,
and that's the same as you saw earlier with the supported color formats. This list is generated through introspection, and I would say that the API to query what are the available pixel formats and how they're composed of components and uh, things is probably in something that will change more than if you have a basic usage of it. But uh, if you only have it, like you have data in this format and another format, you need to convert between them. There's a very, very small API that needs to be used, and that will probably not change. Other questions? Yes? Um, well, um, it was listed as a kind of a dependency of operations. Um, for me, that means you have a node which you can set the device on, use this device, and configure the within height of the image buffer you get from there, um, and you can pick up into the processing graph. And the implementation of that is a little bit unstable. It's much easier with the video format for you to say, use this video file and give me frame on 150, because that doesn't change. A video for Linux device actually changes over time continuously. And so the kind of uh, dirt handling or damage handling of the composited image um, isn't quite as nice with video for Linux as a video file. So I haven't quite decided how to do that in a clean way. In, what? Uh, yeah, but that it doesn't have anything to do with those issues. Uh, it's an issue of the thing that gives you changes in time. I want to be able to cache the results. It's like, this is fine. Unless, unless parameters change, I don't have to redo this work. But with a live video source, you actually have to continuously do processing. And that's not really the kind of thing that the Giggle, Giggle is designed to do. I do want to do it still, so I'll try to find a way to make it work nicely. Um, <coughs> um, well, I'm kind of a game developer, but I'm kind of remaining on the side of the fence of Gaggle. So Gaggle, no, the game developers will call me my customers in that kind of that respect. Um, and um, uh, I think that Gangbash has a public API that shouldn't need to change much for them to use it. They are still claiming that they will access the internal header files and they directly manipulate the objects. And okay, probably won't need to do that. That's my opinion on it. I think it actually it's not probably not fast enough, but some of these things will change and. Um, it's already in a state where integration can start. So it's no longer a GIMP that's waiting for Gecko, it's Gecko that's waiting for GIMP. Maybe there was another question up there? No? I just a small question about the uh, operations. Uh, on, what, what's the level that are you using for including things like the internal that is used in the video? The internal data type used? Yes, uh, you, you just showed us that uh, the brightness and contrast things in each Yes. Is it that I knew operations or the vertical there? Um, the operations themselves, the point operations are all done in fully point. By brightness, contrast, and threshold. And, um, and, but when you, if you're coding an operation from scratch, uh, you would have a gaggle buffer. And from a gaggle buffer, you can request data into a linear buffer that you're going to work on. And when you're requesting that linear buffer, you're using bubble. So you can say that I want to have um, 64 bit LAB in a linear buffer. And then you can't change your data or compute the new linear buffer. And then you write that linear buffer saying, write this to the gaggle buffer as the output, and this is the format of the linear buffer I'm providing. So you're working on a linear buffer in whichever data representation you actually want to have yourself. 
Um, but if you're always working on turbid floating point, and problem matching doesn't have to really work, because it probably got turbid floating point data already. So almost all of the operations at the moment are turbid floating point or GBH, which leads to the least amount of conversions. And it's high enough quality for the things I want to do. Yes? Uh, what file formats do you presently support high dynamic resolution? Um, or do you, uh, I mean, uh, normal JPEG, JPEG files or GIF files or CMG files are uh, regular uh, RGB, RGB uh, data, but you aim to have a high dynamic resolution. That's right. What kind of file? Uh, at the moment, um, the focus of file formats has been mostly on uh, input. So there is uh, file loaders for um, PNG, JPEG, and OpenEXR. And um, OpenEXR being the only one that's high dynamic range. It's for loading 16-bit PNG files. When it comes to saving things, um, there hasn't been much focus on saving things in general. Uh, it supports saving uh, PNG. Um, I think it supports both 16-bit native PNGs, I'm not sure. Um, and it supports, as of the day before yesterday, saving any for video format that Olympic supports. I haven't started playing with creating animations yet, but uh, it should be rather simple to create some interesting things for video. But. So my answer there is, well, at the moment, not that many, but adding um, source operations and sync operations isn't that much work either. And I think, I think someone is working on tips for, for loading at least. When it comes to saving, I don't know. Um, I'm more focused on getting results to the screen than to the disk. So are you interested in making your own file for um, Not for... Um, well, I already actually have kind of file format because the stack files can be loaded back in. Um, but um, when it comes, for instance, to Open Raster, this initiative together with Krita, and that would be a file format for an entire structured layer image. Uh, and within that, uh, we are at the moment at least aiming to reuse JPEG, perhaps for low quality versions, but PNG since it has called 8 bit. 16-bit, alpha, um, RGB, and grayscale, and perhaps reuse um, open EXR in addition for high dynamic range layers. Uh, and that would be the dynamic container uh, that has an XML catalog describing it, the structure of how things are running, connected together, and all of this probably within a zip file, similar to other open document formats.